Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Keras Circle. Keras Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Keras Books, and Keras Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are so excited to be with all of you today, and we love for you to shout out wherever you're watching from. We also love for you to tell us the age of your children and, and what brings you here today. Keras has two um, parenting groups that um, have, are going strong during the pandemic, and so much of our work is built around the idea that if we fight for the liberation and wholeness of our children, that all people will be free and whole. So this event very much um, fits in with that ideology. And so it's a real honor to welcome Sonora Ja tonight. Um, Sonora is an essayist, novelist, researcher, and professor of journalism at Seattle University. She's the author of the novel Foreign, and her op-eds and essays have appeared in the New York Times, the Seattle Times, The Establishment, Dame, and in several anthologies. She grew up in Mumbai and has been chief of the Metropolitan Bureau for the Times of India and contributing editor for East Magazine in Singapore. She teaches fiction and essay writing for Hugo House, Hedgebrook Writers Retreat, and Seattle Public Library. How to Raise a Feminist Son, Motherhood, Masculinity, and the Making of My Family is the book we are here to celebrate tonight. So welcome, Sonora. And we are joined in conversation tonight um, with, by Sarah Ladipo Menyika, who is a novelist, short story writer, essayist, and founding books editor for Ozzy.com. Her debut novel, Independence, is an international bestseller, while her second novel, Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun, has been translated into a number of languages. Her nonfiction includes personal essays and intimate profiles of people she meets, from Toni Morrison to Margaret Busby and Michelle Obama. Sarah currently serves as board president for the Women's Writing Residency Edgebrook and is creator and host of the Museum of the African Diaspora's Conversations Across the Diaspora. Sarah is a 2021 Audi finalist, a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, a San Francisco Public Library laureate, and a member of the National Book Critics Circle. So welcome, Sarah. We are thrilled to have you both here with us tonight. And I just wanna let folks know you can at any point ask questions um, via this ask a question button in the bottom center of your screen. Please don't be shy. Please ask questions about your own family. This is why we're here. Um, feel free and uh, we'll get to as many as we can towards the end. If, if there's a question that's similar to one that you would like to ask, you can upvote an existing question to indicate that it's something that you're interested in. So I'm gonna go ahead and get out of the way and um, let's get this wonderful event started. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Sonora, I'm so excited and I've dressed in you know appropriate colors for your gorgeous book that is gorgeous on the inside as it is on the outside. Congratulations on Thank you, Sarah. This. Thank you. So, Sonora, I think I, mean, I love this quote on the front of the book by Rebecca Solnit, uh, exhilarating and inspiring, a beautiful hybrid of memoir, manifesto, instruction manual, and rumination. And I think that, I mean, I feel that we could add many more things to that list but it's a it's a really good description, and I I would love to just jump right in and ask you how have you created this magnificent multi-layered book um, that is all of these things that is manifesto instruction manual and rumination? Did you set out to write a book that spoke on these different layers? How did it come to be? Um, thank you. First of all, thank you. It's so great to uh, to be able to have this conversation with you. I know that when we serve on the Hedgebrook board, we're all business and, you know, we're working and everything. And and so such a pleasure to just talk to you. So thank you for doing this. Um, uh, how did I think of this particular thing? Well, with a lot of help from my editor, Hannah Elnan at Sasquatch Books, <laughs> when she acquired the book, we talked about the shape it would take. And one of the reasons I was so excited about um, doing this with her and at Sasquatch was that she had the same or a similar vision to mine for what this book should be and encouraged me sort of like along the lines that I was thinking of and just sort of 
saying, yes, this is something that we would like to weave in while also giving me the freedom to be all the things that I wanted to be in this book. So, you know, I was writing a memoir and I was writing the, uh, you know, uh, the essays and I'd written about three essays um, and then started to, you know, imagine what are some of the questions that come up for families um, and different types of families around the raising of boys, cis het boys, um, and sort of like mapping it out that way. And then also thinking about the to-do list, right? Which I love to-do lists and I love lists of like, you know, goals and directions and that may be the Aries in me. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's thinking of that and, um, and saying, okay, that, that's gonna be a takeaway. But before that, leaning into personal essay, leaning into personal storytelling, uh, talking about moments that are deeply personal from my life, like freeing myself uh, from the journalist in me and the academic in me to write those pieces, but then leaning back into the journalist in me and saying, but wait, I also want to ask other people, you know, how does this work for them? Because I cannot represent everyone's story. And even though this is my story, um, my story is only enriched by other people's perspectives, right? So I want to talk to, um, you know, uh, black women raising black boys and black kids. I want to talk to LGBTQ folks, right? I want to talk to trans feminists um, and, you know, feminists across the world as, as far as I could reach. So that was the journalistic element. And then the academic in me kicked in and said, hello, you know, there's a lot of research out there, right? And so, you know, of course, bringing in all of that and as a feminist media scholar, um, also talking to academics and, and psychologists and everything. So, you know, and then of course, then Hannah was able to like sort of corral that, you know, help me like put all that together into one storytelling um, experience or, you know, just so that the reader can, can sort of, I hope, seamlessly go from one aspect of it to the other and leave with the to-do list. Mm. You know, I wanted to add as well to what Rebecca outlined in, in that quote that's on the front of the, the book, which is that this is a very brave book and it takes a lot of courage to share a lot of the personal uh, stories. Um, and you've gone deeply into sort of personal anecdote and sharing. And so I just also wanted to thank you um, for being so brave and so courageous. Um, and it's just also interesting listening to you talking about your editor, Hannah. There is just something wonderful about the way that you're acknowledging the many people in the village that it takes to give birth to a book. Um, and um, I, just, I just love the way that you, you do that too. And you, the way that you, as you say in your book, you you draw not only on your own stories and your own insights and observations, but on other people's stories as well. And it makes for a very, very rich book. Just before we came on, we were commenting on our wonderful audience who had already began to uh, chat before the event began. And I was struck by how many parents, it appears, of young children are on this call or on this event. And so I'm going to ask the impossible. I, I met, actually, the, I think the first comment was by someone who has a two-year-old and they said that, you know, they're very excited to learning, excited and looking forward to learning how to raise a feminist son. Um, and so you're in the right place and you're, you're reading the right book. But Sonora, I just want to ask you, particularly thinking about parents of very young children, what are the two or three or four or five things other than getting hold of this book and reading it um, that you would highlight for people to just to think about mull over in these very early years of raising a child? Yeah, I mean, those early years, right? Like I've forgotten all the problems associated <laughs> with those years. I just remember the delight and the joy. Right? Um, so, you know, I, I think, and I, I write about this, uh, that, you know, it, it starts with fear of different kinds, right? It, it possibly does, right? Like, am I going to be a good parent? Am I, you know, what if I don't, what if I mess up and all of that? And I, and I think the most important thing in the early years is to just lean into 
the love, right? Just to enjoy the baby. And, and because that's, that is really, as, as I'm sure you will relate to that too, Sarah, that that is really what we will miss, you know, being able to hold them and, and um, just the, the baby smell and the, the, the questions and the, you know, um, and, and the, the first steps and the talking and, you know, and, and uh, so I think, first of all, just lean into that, think about different um, mother myths, like, you know, um, think beautiful stories uh, about motherhood or parenthood. And um, also to sort of establish, if you start thinking in terms of, okay, the feminist piece of it, to establish a, a value system, right? A establish feminism as a value system uh, before it becomes sort of like a manifesto where, you know, that, that's a little bit older uh, when they're a little bit older. But um, if it's a value system, it starts to be, it starts to sort of seep into everything that you do, right? So you start very early giving, uh, be, living a more feminist existence, you know, inviting your partner, whatever, gender they may they may be if and whether you're partnered or not but inviting your village or inviting your chosen family anyone around you to honor that value system and say let's commit to having a feminist lens using a feminist language uh be thinking about that as the human being that we're going to raise uh but mostly yeah just enjoy the love and stories and you can never start too early with the stories, right? Like I think starting the, the stories, the songs, the lullabies, all of that, and then bringing a feminist lens to it, of course, but just um, connecting with that because it's it's remarkable how stories sort of last over the whole parenting, you know, and, and beyond, um, something to connect over. I'm just smiling because out of the corner of my eye, I'm not very good at looking at chat while I'm listening to people, but I just saw out of the corner of my eye someone called Elizabeth who says um, they are sitting here nursing my baby, listening to this talk, which I think is just so lovely. Um, and on the topic of stories and telling stories, I would love our audience to be treated by a lovely reading from you. Um, towards the beginning of the book, there's... There's so many lovely passages, it's hard to know where to, what to choose, but maybe you can set this up um, for us. It's a story that um, you told your son. Um, uh, so maybe set that up for us and we'll listen to you read. Um, yeah, I think, I think um, maybe I'll start with the, the part about the goddesses, right? Like um, to think about the stories that I leaned into um, as I, so there's this chapter, it's fairly early in the book and it's called, What Would the Goddesses Do? And it's, uh, you know, trying to tap into some of the stories that I had been, um, I had read, like, you know, about Hindu mythology that, you know, as a, as a teenager, I read those stories and forgot about them, but it's amazing how they came back to me when I started to think about raising a boy. Um, and I had to take them, I wasn't raised very deeply religious, but I took those stories, leaned into them. It was just really beautiful. So talk about the nursing your baby, right? When I would nurse my baby and I would get this, you know, sense of like, oh my goodness, you know, what, what, what am I doing? Am I doing this right? Am I doing it wrong? You know, why is the, the baby not um, suckling? And, you know, all of that, all those things that come. And there was almost like a sensation of, these goddesses sort of, you know, assembling around me and saying, you've got this, it's okay, we're here, you know? And so all these stories rushing into my mind. Um, and so there's this, I'll read from that chapter and it's the story of Yashoda. Um, I can elaborate later, but I'll just jump right in. Um, yeah. Hindu, Hindu mythology was awash in stories of mothers raising sons, but had few tales of mothers raising daughters. This is on page 30, in case people have the book already. When I held the baby Gibran in the crook of my elbow, guiding him to my milk-swollen breast, the goddess mothers came leaping and dancing over my imagination and placed a guiding hand on my shoulder. I hardly trusted my own poor mother to teach me how to raise a boy, 
because by age 27, I had seen enough of how she and my father had raised my brother. So I looked back at those mothers from the four rupee comic books. The three best known stories of mothers raising boys told me that those boys had turned out okay, for the most part, for their time and for the misogyny of their moment and all. One of the greatest love stories in Hindu mythology is the one between Yashoda and her adopted son, Krishna. The baby's birth mother, Devaki, was in prison, thrown there by her, her brother, King Kamsa. Krishna was born in prison, smuggled out and given to Yashoda to raise. The babies born to his mother before him had been bludgeoned to death, dashed on the prison floor. I challenge my generation of Indians to erase from their consciousness the comic book visual of baby head dashing on floor because King Kamsa had been told that he would be vanquished by one of these babies born to his sister. Violent uncle for Krishna, violent uncle role model for Gibran, but we will get to that later. Yashoda, a woman from a lower caste, had no idea of the divine powers that the baby Krishna was born with. She was handed the smuggled baby to raise and got busy with the job of providing copious amounts of love. She nurtured the baby, sang love songs about the sun, forgave him his butter thieving ways, and as he grew into a young man, enabled his outrageous flirtations with every young maiden in the village. Some of the stories make these flirtations sound more like harassment, so I made a note to do better than Yashoda there. For all her enabling and privileging, Yashoda raised a feminist ally. How do we know Krishna was a feminist? When Queen Draupadi from the Hindu epic, the Mahabharata, was being sexually assaulted by her brothers-in-law after her five husbands wagered her in a, in a chess match and lost, she damned all those men in her life and called out to Krishna. The child Krishna had grown into an adult divine power by then. And he was sort of a part divine, part human advisor to this gambling raping family. He showed up as an apparition and draped Draupadi in a never ending sari. The rapist royals tugged and tugged at the miles of sari until they fell down, exhausted, unable to strip Draupadi naked. At another point of time in the history of the universe, and in another comic book tossed to me when my brother was done. A princess named Rukmini was kidnapped and was being forced into marriage with a king at the wishes of her brother and father to advance their kingdom. Rukmini, who had never met Krishna, but had long had a crush on him from the legends she had heard, sent for him through a talking bird. Krishna arrived. She proposed to him. He accepted, they eloped. May we all find men who, if we so choose, drape us in endless silk or elope with us when we're in a bit of a spot. My son probably won't be called to exactly such levels of solidarity or divine intervention. And Krishna's own feminism must be scrutinized as a mere flicker of a torchlight in the dark millennia of patriarchal debauchery in Hindu mythology. But it's hard not to see Yashoda's love in Krishna's actions. Her adoption of Krishna in itself was an act of feminist solidarity. From Yashoda, I learned to love my boy unconditionally. Should I stop there? Sorry, I was I was unmuting and unmuting. Um, no, I don't think you should stop there. I think you should read the next oh, okay. paragraph as well. Please. Okay. No, no. <laughs> um, Yashoda would tell us to love these things about our boys. Their plump fists holding our hands to take their first steps. The way they bounce off the walls with a room full of other kids at a fourth birthday party the way they hold their necks upright and their faces serious 
as they disappear under a barber's cape at their first little haircuts. The way they wind their arms around your neck and legs around your torso because they are afraid in the river or the swimming pool and mama won't let them go, will she? The way they fall down and cry with all the thunder of the universe over a skinned knee. The way they blink in confusion the first time they are told, boys don't cry. The way they run up to dogs or run away from geese. The way they look at their hands when they put on their first ever baseball or cricket glove. The way they take up room in the world and say, like an unbludgeoned, full-headed Krishna, I'm here. Okay, not all of these notations come from Yashoda. Some of them are mine. And none of these things describes the worlds of boys alone. I want to lean into our love of boys in that space before they are, re before they are really much different from a girl, a non-binary space. And I am also hoping and praying for a world that lets our girls take up space in exactly the same way as our boys, because there's enough space for us all. And loving our boys now means teaching them how to move over and make room, make that safe and fulfilling space for our girls. Sonora, thank you so much for indulging us and indulging me. It's just... I, I particularly love the way that you capture um, childhood uh, in that additional paragraph or two that you read. And, you know, the, the title of your book is How to Raise a Feminist Son. And then in smaller letters is Motherhood, Masculinity, and the Making of, of My Family. And I think, you know, those first few words get a lot of attention, but those other things, the motherhood, the masculinity, and the making of my family are equally important. And one of the things that really struck me was that this book, this book is like a love letter on several levels. And it's one, one of them being a love letter to your son. And I thought I would be kind of trying to think of things a little bit inside out in a way, which is to ask you, what has your son taught you about being a feminist mother or more of a feminist mother? Um, it's a bit little, perhaps a little tautological, but I, one of the things that I'm always aware of with having a child is how much they, my child has taught me. And you hinted a few of those things in the book. So I wonder if we're gonna, we're gonna go from the other way around and just, um, you know, some of the things your son has taught you about feminism. Wow. Um, yeah. And I'm going to try and answer that without getting tears in my eyes, because, you know, it's at this point where, you know, with my son being a young adult now, uh, that I get to see some of the feminism, right? And, you know, sort of halfway through writing this book, um, I was thinking of like the title, how to raise a feminist son part of it the the the, the focus is on raise but the the other part is a feminist son because after a while you're raising a feminist son right so the son is already a feminist and you're raising a feminist son so it kind of like is a little bit sort of a like a wave you know like this infinity thing uh it's back and forth because um if he's already a feminist at some point, which I would say was around the age of 14 or 15, uh, you know, he started to see the actual feminist solidarity play out, um, then how do you become more of a feminist, right? Because then he is raising a feminist mother in the same way, or there's that, that we're both practicing the feminism. So for instance, when, uh, you know, there's a, a few things that I remember very clearly. One was, uh, you know, in terms of simple things, was uh, when I was driving him to school when he was uh, in around sixth grade and um, in Seattle. And so this was uh, several years ago. And I, you know, you know how you're driving and you're kind of looking around and I saw this person and I said, um, I said, oh, is that a man or a woman? And my child sitting, you know, my son sitting in the back says, it's a person, do you see a person? And so, <laughs> I had to correct myself and, you know, get really aware of uh, how gendered my and binary my um, my lens was. 
And so that was the sense, and you know, and so I started to encourage that. And I said, yes, yes, I see a person. And, you know, so, so started to encourage that kind of correction from him. Um, and, and that's a, a sort of pushing a little more toward the, a feminist mother, you know, and a feminist woman. And then to a more, um, I would say a more serious um, um, lesson was, uh, not even a lesson, this was really more of a solidarity piece uh, or like, you know, asking me, come on, come on, be more of a feminist, was um, when we were in India in 2013, he was 18, he was about to leave for college and we went to India to sort of, you know, I wanted him to sort of reconnect with, I, I wanted to reconnect with my family and also for him to solidify relationships that would be independent of me going forward. And uh, my mother and I have always had a difficult relationship. So towards that, the end of that trip, the three of us, my mother, he and I were on this trip in Jaipur in India. And my mother, um, um, you know, there was a moment with her that was very difficult. And he stepped in and he spoke to my mother and said, you know, try and think about things from her point of view when she was a child. And I, you know, and India, you know, women are not treated well here. I am treated better than my mother. He said that to my mother. And that was such a profound moment of a boy using the privilege, you know, like he's got the golden glow of the boy grandchild around him, you know, and using that privilege to sort of knock the pedestal that he's been put on and stand in solidarity and say, why am I treated better than my mother, you know? So that was really, really profound. And another instance on that trip was um, that my brother was not, you know, uh, talking to me and I thought that he would come and meet my son at least and he, he didn't. And um, as I was saying goodbye to my son, he was leaving uh, at the airport. And I said, you know, I'm sorry that, uh, you know, this didn't work out with your uncle and you meeting. And my family would like me to forgive him for his violence. And I, you know, I struggle with that. I, I feel like I should do that. I feel like I should do the, forgive him. And he said, uh, well, has he asked for your forgiveness? Has he apologized to you? Because if he hasn't, then the ball is not even in your court. You know, and this is the 18 year old telling me that, you know, and no one had taught me to expect apologies. And it's, I've been thinking about that even recently about how we don't expect as, as women, we've been, we've been told this is your lot, you're going to suffer, bad things are gonna happen to you. And it's a rare, rare instance in which you are tendered an apology. But since then, I've learned to accept or to expect apologies, right? I, I don't every time, right? But sort of like, when I start thinking about it, I feel like, no, you know what? I'm no, I'm owed an apology. So, things like that that sort of push you to be, to be in solidarity, and are also pushing you to be a better feminist for yourself or for others. You know? uh, I mean, those are great. I mean, I've been thinking. My son is is I think a little younger than yours. He's 21 and and with us uh, now because of COVID. Um, and I just, you know, there, there's small things. Recently, he's been talking a lot about the WNBA. He's, he's a varsity athlete, plays basketball. And the, in, the inequities, you know, there's not as much coverage of, of women's sport, particularly women's basketball, pay differentials and so forth. And it's something that, you know, he's taken on as, you know, it's an important thing to discuss and make a noise about. And, you know, so small things like, I mean, it's not a small thing, but that sort of thing, I'm just really happy to see to see him doing. And then I, I thought it was funny, actually, because this morning I said, you know, he's been looking at this book. And one of the great things about this book is that I've been able to have conversations with him and talk to him about different things. And so I said today, I said, um, so, you know, what do you think you've taught me about feminism? And he sort of looked at me and sort of smiled. And he said, he's like, almost like, I know that's a trick question. He says, you know, it's, it's like me talking, you know, saying to one of my white friends, what have you taught me about race? He's like, no, I don't think I've taught you anything. So I said, yeah, good answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ha having said that, though, um, my, my son does have, and those who know him uh, would want me to say this, is that he does have a tendency to mansplain. 
And uh, that is, so, you know, the, the task of raising a feminist son is never really done. You know, you're kind of always in that negotiation. And, and to recognize that, of course, you're not going to raise, you know, we are not a perfect feminist and you're not going to raise the perfect feminist. And the conversations that happen around them, and, and thankfully we have the language, right? We can say, hey, that's gaslighting, that's mansplaining, that's something, you know. Um, and of course, you know, in a humorous way, but, but, um, but sometimes it's serious and it just feels like, no, I'm not going to be mansplained to, and you need to stop and you need to apologize for this and not. So, you know, so, so I'm, I'm glad that you're, I'm glad that your, uh, your son understood that and, um, you know, didn't, didn't, I, didn't take the bait, didn't take the bait. <laughs> I think it was, it was a preemptive move so that I wouldn't say, ah, don't try and mansplain. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so Nora, uh, you know, another thing that I really love about this book is that you address the importance of feminism in the context of other social identities, whether it's um, class or sexuality or race. Um, so it's not, you're not just kind of addressing it in a bubble. And um, there was a section, this is now towards the end of the book in chapter 11, uh, let me see what chapter 11 is called. Um, uh, should have had a... There's a section when you're, you're talking... So chapter 11 is called, Will my boy of colour feel too burdened? Will my white son feel too guilty? And I found myself before reading the chapter asking the question, will my son be safe? Um, you know, we were having this conversation a few days after yet another uh, young black man, a father himself, um, has been shot dead by the police. Um, and Dante Wright is his name. And I think in, uh, talking about feminism, feminism and intersectionality is really important because you know, there are situations and you sort of you, you I'll, I'll ask you to explain the situation that you outline in your book. But, you know, when I think about my son, for example, I'm going to I'm going to try and encourage my son to be aware of the dangers around him. And so I think of, you know, if, he, if he's going to a party, for example, and um, someone is, you know, people are being sexist or, or you know, I don't want my son to jump in and kind of, uh, you know, try and save someone if, you know, then it kind of deteriorates and the police rock up and who are they going to, you know, target for causing problems, but a black man. So these things are complex. Um, you know, maybe I'm, I'm not doing a very good job of articulating this, but it's important to realize that it's easier, I think, in some situations for some people to speak out, um, perhaps, than it is for others, which is not to ex make excuses for anyone. But I think it's really important that people understand that, um, you know, race adds another layer of things, as does class and as does, you know, all these other um, aspects that you've addressed in your book. Mm -hmm. So if you want to just maybe talk about the example that you highlighted. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for raising that and i'm sure it's a difficult thing to raise because even talking about something like this you know as you as um, the mother of a young black man and me as the mother of a brown skinned boy you know we know that when we're talking about feminism that's why i said like it can feel like a burden right like because if you look at the history of the us and you go back to the story of mh till you know uh, and, and, and then all, all the brutalities after, that a white woman can accuse a black boy of whistling at her and white men will come and give the boy a brutal, brutal death. And, and even now people go and shoot into, uh, into his memorial. And um, so, you know, every and every, incident like Dante Wright's uh, being the latest. I, I just don't want one more name, you know. Um, every such incident reminds us of how of how uh, vulnerable they are. And 
I've had this conversation with my son, for instance. I'll get to the what I talk about in the book, but because I we were talking about it just today, he's visiting for a few days, and and uh, we were just talking about it. And you know, I've had this conversation with him exactly like you're saying, right? I've said, hey, if something happened when he was he went for the Black Lives Matter protests in Boston, and I said, look, you know, you, you like just be careful, like run away, and you know, and he said, if some if something happens, I'm going to get in there and fight and say, you know, I'm not running away from if someone's in, in danger that I need to save, right? And so you have to take a deep breath and just like hope for the best, right? Um, and, and I understand that he, as a brown-skinned man, you know, it it's horrible to, to think about degrees of safety or danger, right? But uh, also, at, at, on any day, he can be mistaken to be a Muslim man, or you know. So there are all these different incidents. Like how much, how much, how afraid should I be, right? So there's there's all of that that we talk to them about, and then to also say feminism, right? So I asked him this question recently, and I said, you know, and, and it's in the book too. I asked him, did was it harder for you to practice feminism as a boy of color and as a young man of color? And he said, no, it makes things easier. Because when you think about the liberation of uh, everyone, right, you become sensitive to the, and, and, and you become sensitive to the fact that no one is liberated, un, you know, and a lot of people have said this before, right, that no, but no one is liberated unless all of us are liberated. And if I embrace feminism, if I say I'm going to stand in solidarity with half of humanity, right, that I am standing in solidarity with all of humanity and if all of human you know and so we all have to what what is humanity right uh then we begin to define that and and that means we all need to come along so it cannot it's not possible for me to not be a feminist and i thought of examples of yeah where, where that's true you know that not all men of color would think that way right i come from a very patriarchal culture where that may not be true but um so the incident in the book that you're talking about, you know, and I have to preface that with when I came to the U.S. and I bring my son here, I'm bringing him from the privileges of that Brahminical patriarchy in India that he would have benefited from. And I was my idea was to strip him of those. But then here we are and we are the other and we are the outsider, the foreign brown person. Um, and so. I'm raising him within the disadvantages of that, or the or the in, inequities of that, right, and the structural inequities of that. Um, so I began to see as he grew up, right. So around the age, I think he was uh, 17, when he had forgotten his keys, uh, his house keys, like 17 year olds are wont to do, and he was trying. And uh, this was in Queen Anne, which is an upscale neighborhood in Seattle. And he and his friend wanted to go home after school and play video games. And they were climbing in through a window. And the neighbor, who should have seen us there uh, and should, be, should have known us, right, um, called the cops on him. And he called me. And this was just a few weeks before Trayvon Martin. And I didn't know when he called me the scope of what we were dealing with, right? Like, the, what exactly? And so when, when the Trayvon Martin uh, murder and tragedy happened uh, is when it really just struck me how um, how how dangerous that episode had been right I got to him on time and of course and um, you know and nothing terrible happened but but I live in the in the memory of that right and then uh, in that same chapter I talk about where it inter intersects with feminism is that with his stepsister when she was, you know, there was this incident where we were, um, she, I picked her up from a yoga class and she had to go for math tutoring. And my son was visiting from college, you know, and she was wearing her yoga gear and looking super cute. And, you know, she was 16, my son is about 21. And when I dropped her off, I just felt like she seemed a little vulnerable in her, you know, yoga pants and things going, um, and waiting outside the building for her math tutor to come and come down and let her in. And so I told my son, okay, get out of the car and just keep a keep an eye on her. I'm gonna circle. I couldn't find parking, you know that. So I um I, I said I'm gonna circle around and come back. And 
And when I, when I circled around and came back, my son was watching her, waiting for her math tutor. You know, she was at a bit of a distance. And there was this man standing sort of a little bit behind him, uh, a white man with his arms crossed ac across his chest and staring, glaring at the, you know, at my son, because what he was probably seeing was um, a brown skinned young man staring at a white girl, right? Um, and so in his head, that could only mean one thing, you know, and I could see from his body language that he was watching for some, like, something bad. And that just like broke my heart because here he was like, you know, grudgingly look, you know, looking at his stepsister and watching out for her. And so, you know, I, it, that's where the intersection of those things just really hit home. That's, that for boys of color, when we ask them to be feminists, we'd like something back in return from all, all people, right? Especially white people. That I, and I end that chapter by saying, you know, I. America, I've given you this madman who's going to be looking out for white girls, brown girls, black girls, you know, everyone and, and people of other genders as well. And I hope you're looking out for my son. So I, I just hope people are looking out for our sons. Mm -hmm. No, and that, and that was a very powerful, powerful way to end, to end that chapter. You know, another thing that I really appreciate about this book is that it's one thing for us to teach our children things. Um, it's another thing to realize, you know, the society in which we're, we're sending them out into. Um, but then, and this is also one of the things that my son said to me, he's like, you know, I really appreciate all that you've done as my, as my mother. Um, but then of course there's school and there's, you know, the wider world of, media and publicity and these are all things that you address in your book um and so we 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 only go so far um and so i really like the way that you talk about how intentional you have been in terms of trying to think about his other environments trying to think about schools thinking about the media that he consumes um there's one other thing that I wanted to just add to your book, and you know me well enough to know that this is a bit of a, a pet thing for me, which is that all of the inequalities and the gender biases and so forth that we're seeing in this present world are just exacerbated with AI, artificial intelligence. And this is also just something that I think about a lot. If we think things are, are bad now, um, you know, what, what is this future world in which AI will play an, an ever larger and larger role? Um, what does that look like um, when it's kind of looking at modeling on what we have as a society now? So I wondered if you just want to say a little bit about the importance of trying to have an impact on environments that we ultimately can't fully control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you know, it strikes me that okay, yes. So maybe there's another chapter that needs to be written about AI and its role, right? And that in a few years, that's where we're going to be, and so we'll have to keep adapting to whatever influences are going around our kids. So when my kid was young, all he had was a Game Boy, and I could watch him play his Game Boy, right? And then we had the internet, and then he would be gone for hours, and you know, on his, in his room, and I don't, I don't have any access to that, and. And sure, there were people who would say, oh, you should go in there and then spy on his browser window and, you know, look up what he's looking at, keep monitoring who your fr kid's friends are. And I say, no, that we will never be able to really, you know, it's not like the, the, the playground of today is just so vast. It's not like saying, oh, who's your buddy, you know, because they could be with someone on, on, um, on Twitch, right? They could be playing a video game with people of all kinds, and and there's a lot of misogyny, as we know, in um, in, the, in video game culture. And so, and then you know, 4chan and 8chan and and Reddit and all all these things that I, you know, as a media professor, I try to keep up, but there's no way I'm I'm immersing myself in that, right? So, the thing that we need to teach them is that look. I know that those environments are, um, you know, are things that we don't talk about in our family, or we don't. I don't know what those environments are. You are going into them. I want you to just have 
the value systems that we grew up with, right? Use your voice. And um, and if people are being misogynistic, just use your voice. You know, you have the ability to sort of be a little bit removed from that situation. Um, and so I think we just have to keep adapting. And that's why when I say that it's a set of values that we fall back on, that you have to then trust them at some point and say, look, wherever you're going, go with these, this set of values because it served us well, right? It served your, your mother well. It served the people around us well. And it's the only way to be, you know? And then hope for the best. And of course, have a lot of conversations. So that's why I talk about stories, because when you're talking about stories, you know, he will raise with me, hey, mama, you know, I, this is what I read. Like he told me that he'd read the whole of Elliot Rogers' manifesto, the, you know, the uh, Isla, um, Isla Vista guy who had shot, uh, the shooter who shot all these people. And I was very disturbed and I said, why do you have to go down that rabbit hole? Why are you reading his manifesto? And he said, no, it's it's a fascinating um, document and I know how to read it and not, you know, of course I'm affected by it, but it's not like I'm getting brainwashed by his ideology. It's more to like say, oh, this is, this is gross. This is horrifying. I wanna have nothing to do with it, but also bring some sort of a lens of, you know, society and alienation and, you know, culture and uh, all of that into it. And so he brings back these stories for discussion. And because he knows it's mostly a non-judgmental space, you know, there are times when I feel like this is too much. I cannot talk about this, but mostly a non-judgmental space. And he knows that I'll be interested. So I think that's all we can do. We can keep our conversations open and we can say, hey, I trust you with this because I'm not looking over your shoulder and I'm not going to be that kind of parent, you know? I think that's another thing that I really, I really liked about what, what you wrote and you emphasize this a few times that it's important to keep those channels of communication open. I think with every generation of parent, there are things that we just will all roll our eyes at and think, oh my God, how can you do that? And, you know, and it, but it's important that children feel that they can share. And sometimes it takes a lot of power for us to kind of hold back <laughs> and not be too judgmental so that we don't shut those doors um, because it is important. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also important that children have others as well. They won't necessarily share everything with parents um, who, can be soundboards and and you, you you know friends as well and you meant you mentioned that your son had this too which was very important. I mean, I should say another thing that I really admire about the book, um, Sonora, is that you you talk about how we all make mistakes and we can all do better. Uh, whether this is in reference to your father, it was a, you know you talk about your father who. Um, had many issues and how he's evolved and he's grown and we've, we must always keep the door open for people to move on and do better. Um, and so that really spoke to me in the book. I want to pivot to talk about two other things, two other aspects that maybe others haven't talked about. And this is going to just kind of geek out as a fellow writer here. And just again, encourage people to feel free to ask questions. Um, hopefully we'll get to a few questions before the end of this period, which is already flying by. Um, Sonora, I happen to know that you have recorded this as an audio book as well. And I, I love the audio, um, the audio format and I've recorded, I've been able to record my two books as audio books and I've judged two books over the last year. And because I've had to read a lot of books, I've had to read a lot of them via audio just to save my eyes a little bit. Um, and so that, that's great that people can hear, you heard Sonora read and you can also hear her read this book as an audio book. I'd like to ask, what, did, what was surprising? I think this is the first book you've recorded as an audio book, is that correct? Yes. And I've heard you say that the word you would use, use to describe that experience was surprising. Um, so tell us a little bit about what it was like to record it as an audiobook and what was so surprising. Thank you. And and isn't one of your audiobooks a finalist for an award for best well-read audiobooks and things? Like, yeah, I mean congratulations Sarah because you know you've got Thank a beautiful you. voice so um well this uh, I yeah 
it was surprising that I could do it in the first place, you know, because I, I didn't know anything about that. I just showed up at the studio and they'd given me a few instructions. And um, I showed up and, you know, they set me up and everything. And, uh, and then they asked me, uh, oh, surely you've had, uh, you have an acting background because you're doing this well. And I was just like, no, I don't. So I, I was very pleased, as you can tell, with myself that, that they would think that I had an acting background because I was able to bring some emotion. But the, the surprising part was also how much I enjoyed it. You know, I really, really enjoyed it. And um, I was, it was almost like, you know, when you're editing things, you're sort of going from chapter to chapter, you know, you're in the sort of thick of it and with the written word, but it isn't until you speak it out loud in, you know, in a stretch of time that, um, that you can feel it, you know. So, so the the moments of tenderness or sadness, or you know, that I was able to feel that ride of the joy and the and the moments of uh, you know, like the moment of the um, uh, you know, the, the, where I was realizing that he was a racialized body in the in the sight of uh, uh, the white imagination. So those kinds of things uh, surprised me that I could, you know, feel it and that I could read it with with the emotion that I was having in reading it, and um, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, also, that I had been mispronouncing certain words all my life, and I and I say that with with the with all global pronunciations of the you know the British Indian pronunciation, etc. I was even I was I had thought of different things that are not even the British Indian thing or the British intonation or anything. The word doctoral, for instance, I had been saying doctoral all along and that, and then I have a doctoral degree, right? So <laughs> that was really surprising that, oh my goodness, was I saying this word wrong all along and no one corrected me? So little surprises like that too. <laughs> and there's some, some words that are particularly hard. I remember for me, linoleum, just to wrap your tongue around that are hard. Um, I mean, I don't know if you also found, I mean, I, part of the reason why I, part of the, the, the joy of recording books as audiobooks for me was that I felt that I learned a lot on so many diff different levels. And speaking of gender, one of the things that I found myself thinking about most recently when I recorded my second book was the, the stereotype that, a male voice is really low and a female voice is high <laughs> and I have a particularly low voice but I you know and I, so it, you know I just thought huh you know I don't have to defer to this it has to be low and it has to be high um so that was just something I found myself thinking about and I also I don't know what it was like for you but in I I've had in the course of recording my books, I've had three different sound engineers and they've all been men. They've all, all been white men of different ages. And I, I sort of had this surreal feeling reading my books, like they have no choice but to listen to my stories. <laughs> and there's a lot, lot in my work that has to do with, with race and, and gender and so forth. And so that was an interesting experience as well. Um, you know, and then back to the sort of, you know, I don't know if I should pronounce this in the British way or the American way and how this is, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it was a fascinating experience on many different levels. Yeah, and you know, I was doing this during COVID time. So uh, the producer, Lisa, uh, Lisa was in my ears and, and I couldn't see her so much, but I could see the sound engineer and you're absolutely right. He was uh, around my age, a white male and he was listening to all of this. And there were times when I became like, you know, a little self-conscious, like, oh my goodness, you know. Uh, but every time I would emerge after a few hours of reading, uh, he would say, oh my goodness, that was beautiful. And I could tell that he was really moved because he asked me questions and we would sit down to a socially distanced lunch and talked about things and about parenting and boys and, and my experiences. And, you know, um, I feel like, I feel like there was uh, he had he was moved, you know, he was moved mm. by the story, and and so that that was an unexpected consequence. Just one one person in a pandemic in that was moved. You know? mm -hmm. No, that's great. Um, so I now want to talk about book covers. This is such a beautiful book cover, and those who have 
published books will know that one often doesn't have a, a choice when it comes to book cover design. Um, so I'm wondering if you had a choice, if you had a say, and um, do you love your book cover as much as I like it? <laughs> I absolutely love it. And I'm not just saying that because I suddenly noticed that Hannah Elnan, my editor, is in the chat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I absolutely love it, and I love that she. I mean, this is my this was my experience with working with Sasquatch Books that they were really, really receptive. Um, we had a, a, an earlier cover that I wasn't terribly excited about, and I, I still have the email from Hannah that says, "I want you to love it, not just like it or be okay with it." So we'll go back and we'll work on something. And interestingly, you know, I was I was at Hedgebrook. Uh, sitting in, uh, and those who know Hedgebrook will know what this is, as Sarah, as Sarah knows, uh, sitting in the window on the bench, you know, sort of zoning out, staring at some trees, and I get this message from Hannah, my editor, saying, how about this? And it was this cover uh, with a pic an image of a tree. And it was just so perfect, you know, where you know it. Like, you, you, I could feel it in my heart. And it's an image from... Uh, a fort in India, which is the fort where my mother and my son and I went, the, you know, the thing that I was describing to you on that vacation where we had that difficult moment. And it's an image from there. And so it just felt so right. And these are just my favorite colors ever, you know. Um, so I was just, I fell in love with it. And um, yeah, and then it was just like, yeah, this this is it, you know. So I'm I'm just fortunate, really fortunate, but because you're right, you don't always get the cover you want. <laughs> yeah. So I see that we're beginning to get questions, which is great. So I'm just going to ask you one more question and then pivot uh, to what others are asking, uh, which is what next? Because you you write fiction beautifully in your a pro at nonfiction, as we see from many of the things, the articles that you've written and this book. Um, what next? Wow, uh, thanks for asking that. I mean, I'm going for, for a few weeks not writing anything, right? I'm just trying to be in that space of like, just, ah, oh, my goodness, I, I, I'm not going to write anything except emails, right? Um, but I have written uh, another novel. I've written a, a, a second novel and um, I'm, I'm working on some edits with that, and um, I'm very excited about that. It's uh, about a white man. And uh, so, yeah, it's a very different book from this one. But again, you know, I'm a feminist, and you'll get, you know, feminism in there, and you get these these values that I have in there, but in a very different, it's, it's a satire. So um, I, th I think I'm just going to love you know, this form of the personal essay and go deeper into it. And, um, you know, and I, I'm, I know that there's another collection of essays that I'm beginning to lean into. So just reading a lot right now and resting in this space of not writing, which will last just a few weeks and then you know, I'll be back. In. Thanks for that. Yeah, I'm just always, I'm just sort of smiling at myself because I hate it when people ask me that question. It's like, oh, can I just take a break? And it's, you know, the whole thing of touring and having to talk about the book and then people already asking what's next. It's like, enjoy this book for the next 10 years and then I'll come back to you. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay, well, we have a question here, which is you mentioned that you have different parenting values from your mother. Uh, can you talk a bit about how to protect or transmit your own parenting values when your child spends time with a grandparent who doesn't share your feminist values? Um, and I'm sorry, I don't know who this is coming from. It may, maybe is it is it uh, Charis books themselves? Or I anyway. Um, and now I'm not sure. If, is it Charis? Is that how it's pronounced? Now thinking about audiobooks. Charis. 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 Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting sort of yeah. question. Yeah. Um, I've had to do that a lot, right? Um, I, my family would be progressive in many ways compared to a lot of Indian families. So it's thought of itself... They, my parents thought of themselves as progressive and and really aspired to be that. Um, we, the girls were being raised to be, 
you know, professionals and, you know, in careers. And, uh, but we were also, I, I don't remember a single time that my brother cooked for me, was asked to cook for me, whereas I was asked to cook for him all the time, like, you know, uh, fix him a sandwich. And he could ask me that. And I would unquestion, you know, I may, I may groan and everything, but I would not use a feminist argument to not do it. I would do, you know, but I, I can't remember a single time where, you know, he was asked to. And, and then there was violence. And there was all kinds of things. Uh, so I didn't want my son to inherit those or to see those. And I also didn't want him to see his mother being treated badly. And that is something that looks like, you know, it looks like I wasn't able to uh, protect him from. Um, so to answer the question, I think what, what one does is like you have to, uh, you have to bring in, I talk about the feminist village, right? Where, where's your feminist village? And I had to bring in people who had the same values as me, make them important in my life, right? So that they were buffers for the other things. So, you know, it's sort of like a cleanup act. Of course, you're going to want your family close to your kids, like grandparents, uncles, aunts, um, and even sometimes your partner, right? Maybe that's not, you both are not on the same page about, feminism uh, or a feminist upbringing. So I think you have to do the best that you can and keep that conversation alive and also do the cleanup act where if they've gone and they've witnessed something, you know, that is very sexist and um, that, you know, sort of raise that and say, you know, I was very uncomfortable when that was going on. I was kind of, I didn't enjoy that. I didn't, I didn't like the way that person said that because don't you think that, you know, um, you know, it feels a little unequal or, it, you know, how do you think she felt about this? Or, you know, how do you think um, uncle so-and-so feels when they make jokes about LGBTQ people? And, and uh, you know, those kinds of things sort of bring that sense of compassion and empathy, because once you grow that, that, that muscle called empathy, that is a very important muscle for feminism, right? Especially for a boy. So I think those little things and, 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 and even though these feel like individual actions, what we want is changing of structures, right? We want countries and, and the world to change. But when you do these individual actions and you give them that lens and give them that sense of power that you can effect larger change, then who knows at what level they may do it. But yeah, you have to do little tweaks like that and empower kids to say, you know, to have body autonomy and say, I don't want to hug and kiss and and give them that sense of you can think and feel differently from the people around you, including yourself, right? And just say that these are my values. You can develop and adapt them. These are things that are important to me, but I will love you uh, no matter what. Right? So. Mm -hmm. um. What you know, I think that's very powerful and and to the point of what um, what you've just said. I one of the things that I had wanted to highlight earlier that I loved about the beginning of the book, and you've just said your son is with you now, so I want to ask: uh, you love to see films together. Um, so during this COVID period, where lots of us have been watching films, are there a few? films that you would particularly highlight? Is there a film that you're really looking forward to seeing together? Oh my goodness. We've just, you know, the other day I was driving past the, the movie theater that we usually go to and we were talking about how visceral it was to the, the desire to just go into the movie theater and watch a movie and how much we missed it, you know, because that is really our, our activity, you know, our thing to do. Um, we've been more than anything uh, else. We uh, more than a movie. We've been watching uh, the Gilmore Girls. The other day, we were just you know we, we've kind of run out of things to watch, right, <laughs> individually and separately. Um, but the Gilmore Girls was uh, something that we watched when he was a kid. We were, before we had you know uh, DVR and even you know recording things. We would it was it used to be on on Tuesday nights, and we. Everyone was instructed, do not call us on a Tuesday night. We'd get our dinner together, We'd sit down in front of the television, not answer the telephone. These are all old concepts, I know. Um, but we would watch the Gilmore Girls together. And so we were watching and it was so cute because we were humming the tune along, you know, the opening credit song. And, um, and then, you know, in hindsight, talking about their relationships and, 
and um, you know, there's that the, the tension between her, and the Lorelai Gilmore, and her mother, and you know, all those things. It, it was such a trip down memory lane, and of course, I was getting teary eyed, and and again, immediately there was this sense of solidarity because. Um, my mother hasn't spoken to me in three years because I, I wrote an essay, uh, one of these kinds of essays in which I called out my brother's violence and that went viral in India and she called to say, I never want to talk to you again. So, you know, she's constantly taken my brother's side of things and um, and I, I was weeping and my son has a very good relationship with his grandmother, right? And um, so th this also speaks to your earlier question. Um, but, uh, you know, he said, oh, why are you crying? And he, I said, I don't know, I just sort of remembered. And I try not to talk to him about too many of these tension kind of written things. And I said, I just, you know, suddenly missed my mom. And, um, you know, and she hasn't talked to me in three years. And he said, you know, I think you're in a better place because I don't think she treated you very well. And so these are difficult things. But I think you're in a better place to not have that relationship be very dominant in your life and it was just so loving you know it was it wasn't an accusation necessarily of her um and and to be able you know to have to keep that so so to get back to your thing that you know stories give you that sense of like you know watching television or watching um a movie right we've always had that that we can watch something and it reminds us, and we can have a have a conversation about our own lives, especially when boys start to pull away, right? Which is, in some ways, it feels an inevitable because of masculinity saying, "Hey, don't be this close to your mom," which is just awful. I hope it's it's different as as you know those of you that are raising young kids. But that masculinity also comes for my son every now and then, right? But uh, so in that situation, we can use that that story trope and apply it to our lives and feel like a sense of uh, love and solid solidarity around that. So yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for us to be able to get back to the movies. I cannot wait. <laughs> Great. Well, this is a, this is a very quiet audience. I'm <laughs> waiting to see if there are more questions. Um, I'm going to give you a couple more minutes. But going back to talking about films, um, what, what you know, one of the, I, I heard you talking about audiobooks, and I heard one of the questions was, you know, who else could have read your book other than you? And I think you rightly said no one else could have read my book. Um, I've been thinking, I've been watching Riz Ahmad, and I sort of I was playing with the idea of what would it be like if actually if a man read your book. Oh. And and I think he's 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 my favorite actor of the month at the moment. Um, the the recent film um, Sound of Metal, mm -hmm. extraordinary acting. Um, anyway, so I just thought about him as an actor. Oh, might, my might might do justice in a very different way to your book. I would love that. Do I get to meet him though? Because he's super cute. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's a whole other question. <laughs> I think that should be required. In that case. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, He's terrific. Uh, yeah, that's so interesting. If if he were, you know, if a man were to read it or a male voice were to read it, um, we should we should start doing things like that. You know, I just want to say, everyone who doesn't already have a copy of this book, get a copy, get another copy, send it to friends. Um, it's great. And you have, I think, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about are so you've got sort of little to do uh, bits at the end of each chapter, each chapter, which is great. And then you've got a whole section, uh, resources, books, suggestions and, and films. Um, so it's really, it's not only just a delicious and wonderful read and so insightful on so many levels, but they're also many great resources for people to access. So I can see people are congratulating you um, and talking about how those bits, every little bit of this book is priceless. So um, just a huge congratulations. It's an amazing book and just, it's been a privilege and an honor to talk to you about it. Mine too, Sarah. Thank you so much for doing this and thank you for appreciating my book. Thank you. Thank you so much to you both. This was a beautiful conversation and I want to encourage everyone, if you've not purchased the book yet, to just click this teal button at the bottom center of your screen. 
that'll take you right to the page where you can buy it directly from Karis Books. And as an independent feminist bookstore, it really does help us when you buy your event books directly from us. Um, the other thing is, of course, you can buy Sarah's books from us. And uh, if you, you know, it, it's great to uh, to celebrate um, our all of our speakers' books. So check out her novels as well. Um, Karis is also a nonprofit, and so we do this work um, by you know seeking seeking support from all of you. Um, and we realize that everybody's money is all over the place during the pandemic. So um, we really do appreciate any level of support that you were able to give and we are also just really glad that you're all here tonight um we are so grateful to all of you who are seeking to raise your children and especially your boys in more conscious ways um we really do believe that um as i said at the beginning whatever we do for our children will have the most lasting impact on our society so um thank you for taking the time to be here with us tonight um, and Sonora, thank you so much for this book. It is it is really lovely, and it's it's a hopeful book. And I think I think people really need that um, right now. And you know, there's so much about the crisis of masculinity, and um, so much so much despair, uh, rightly so, because there's so much violence in the world. But I I think this book is immensely hopeful, and I think it's going to give a lot of parents um, a lot of comfort and a lot of uh, a, a roadmap, really. So. Um, Thank you to you both, um, and I hope that you stay safe and well, and uh, I look forward to future work from you both. Thank you so much, and, and all power to your bookstore. We need bookstores like yours, so thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you.